So in the previous lecture, we uh, learned about attention and self-attention, and we learned attention in most general form. Uh, in today's lecture, we are going to learn about transformer, and if uh, time allows, about BERT and GPT uh, that are transformer-based models as well. OK, let me quickly remind you what was uh, attention. In general form, attention was given a query. Uh, we compute the similarity of query with all keys and then pass this similarity through, uh, through softmax to have coefficient of values and then we make a weighted sum of values and that would be the new value of each position. And in matrix form, you can write it this way. Um, X is in d-dimensional query and K is in p-dimensional in most general form and V does not be does not need to be in p-dimensional necessarily it could be in m-dimensional because when you do this uh, matrix multiplication here Q transpose K would be n by n and then uh, when V is uh, basically you know you, you can project it to any dimension, you know, it doesn't need to be in P. Q and K needs to be in the same dimension, but V could be in a different dimension. They should be in the same dimension because of this dot product. Okay, so we learned about this. That's self-attention or attention in, in, in the most general form. And transformer is a model based on uh, attention. It was introduced in 2017 in this paper, attention is all you need. And that was the first time that a uh, set of researchers in Google actually tried to uh, take care of data with sequence, you know, data that is recurrence. Uh, without RNN or LSTM, without these notions that we learned before, and basically the claim of this paper was that uh, the only thing that you need is attention and you know but with, with the structure of attentions basically you can handle this type of data, sequential data. Uh, it is pretty influential paper and influential work, it's in fact a breakthrough. It was based on BERT, GPT and many other models that we use in large language models and even in image processing these days. And uh, almost any uh, language model that we use these days are transformer based. So this is the structure of transformer. At the first glance, it might uh, seem uh, complicated, but I will break it down and explain it step by step how it works. Uh, transformer actually has two parts, encoder and decoder. We are familiar with the concept of encoder, decoder. You know, in RNN we learned about encoder and decoder and uh, also encoder as CN and decoder as RNN in different ways. That encoder is supposed to take a data and make uh, a, a context vector which distill all information as the input and then pass it to decoder. And decoder make a new representation of the data. In this case, the input is sequential and the output is also sequential. So consider language. You want to do trans translation, for example, uh, or question answering. So both input and output of the model are sequential. So I want to take a sequence and pass a sequence. So I have two parts. A part is encoder and the other part is decoder. Let's start with encoder. <clears throat> okay, encoder actually has uh, two main components. It has self-attention And we know what self-attention is, right? So you have a sequence of words, for example. You have a sentence. Each sentence 
uh, has some words or some tokens, you know. And then you have, you need a vector representation of each of these words. I mentioned before that in the past, the common practice was to apply some algorithm and find some fixed representation for each word, like algorithms like word to vec or uh, glove, which basically find a fixed representation of each word. That's not a common practice anymore. So we have uh, a layer here which is called input embedding. And in input embedding, we learn the representation for words during the process, end to end. So it, it, it will be initialized at the beginning and through back propagation, we are going to have word representation for each word. So at the output of this layer, input embedding, we have vector representation for each token or for each word then this vector representation needs to have three different uh, uh, basically uh, role, query, key, and value. So that's what this arrow is here actually means. So um, input vector is going to have three different representation as query, key, and um, values. And if the input is x, that's going to be w transpose qx, and this is going to be w transpose kx, and this is going to be w transpose k uh, value, sorry, v value, vx, okay? So this goes to self-attention. Self-attention, we know how self-attention works, right? It's going to be like V soft max of uh, Q transpose K divided by square root of P. So that's going to be the output of this self-attention, OK? OK, at the output of this self-attention, I'm going to have a residual connection, this one, okay? So the output here is Z. But I'm going to have a residual connection, and this residual connection basically takes this X, pass it here. So after this residual connection, instead of z, I'm going to have what? z plus x. Okay, why we need this? You know, through self-attention, you are looking at interaction of words, right? And the value that you compute at the end, the value that you compute at the end as z, has information about compositions, has information about group of words, the meaning of them. But meanwhile, you want to preserve the identity of each token or each word, you know. Yes, it's important that in our previous example, early beard has a meaning together, but I have to be careful that early by itself and bared by itself also are, have important meaning that I have to preserve it, you know? So basically, x comes back here and will be added to z. So z has information about aggregation of the information, and x has individual information of words. We will add them up. And then we normalize it. You know, see this layer of add and norm? We normalize it. And normalization would be pretty similar to batch norm, to layer normalization. So by this bracket, I mean it has been normalized now. OK, that's basically the first part of uh, this uh, encoder, which is self-attention and add norm 
with a residual connection. Okay, so at the end I have this normalized uh, x plus z. Okay, so see it's called multi-head attention. You know what I told you was just was self attention. By multi-head attention, we mean that there are many of these. It's not only one. You know. So there is this self attention. There is another layer of self attention here, and there is another layer of self attention here, and so on and so forth. Okay, so basically, uh, in the original uh, paper, I mean, in general, there are h of them. And in the original paper, this h is eight. There are eight of them. So uh, when you have x, basically, you know, you compute w q transpose x to find the query in the first layer. So let's call it w one. In the second layer of self attention call it W2, and you have H of them, so call it WH. So the same process that I explained will happen H times. So at the end, I don't have one Z, I have Z1, Z2 up to ZH, right? And each of them will be added with this X, and each of them will be normalized. So eventually I have many of these, right? Okay, um, so what I'm, yes? Um, how do you ensure that the Ws don't learn the same thing? It's pretty similar to uh, convolutional neural network. You know, in convolutional neural network, you are learning many feature maps. Think of these as feature maps, exactly, you know? And you have several kernels, and uh, each of them supposed to learn some sort of features. So on, on paper, yes, it is possible that two of them are identical, but what's the chance of that, you know, in practice? These are just weights, and you do back propagation over weights with some initial values, and it's different, yes. Um, so I have eight or H, Z. What was the dimensionality of Z? You remember? You know, dimensionality of uh, X was D, dimensionality of Q and K was uh, P, dimensionality of V was M, right? So dimensionality of Z is M, and they have H of them. So the dimensionality is H times M. In the original paper, it's eight times m. Okay. So uh, again, remember, uh, in uh, convolutional neural network, we had many feature maps, and then we had to concatenate all of them and then project it back to the dimension that we need, right? If you want to use all of this information, we are going to do exactly the same thing. You know. You have uh, Z1, you have Z2, up to, in the original paper, Z8. So it is M times 8, the dimensionality of these. Okay. So to reduce the dimensionality to M, I'm going to multiply this by a new W, which is going to be, again, parameters of the model. I'm going to multiply this to a new W, which take this M by 8 and give me a new Z, which is uh, M by 1. Okay. So we are going to concatenate all of them. That's going to be a long vector of this form. And then you multiply this by a new linear uh, by, by, by a matrix, W null, which is uh, reduce the dimensionality to M, to the dimensionality that you need. Okay, and that's going to be your new Z. Okay. Any questions so far? Okay. 
So that was basically the first part of this um, transform. So at the end, at the end of this process, I'm going to have, you know, normalized Z plus X actually in many different layers concatenated together and then uh, projected back to dimensionality that I need. Now I have uh, a vector of length M, okay? So the second part of uh, the second part of this encoder is this part, which is a feed-forward neural network. Okay. So conceptually, let me raise this. So uh, omitting the details, you can think that, okay, the first one is just self-attention X comes in and uh, X comes in and, you know, Z goes out. The second part is fit forward neural network. So I always talk about uh, vectors, vector x, vector z, vector q. But you know, in practice, what you pass to the model is not a vector, it's just a matrix, you know. You pass all positions together. You know, you have a sentence, you pass all of the positions of the sentence uh, at the same time to the model. That's one of the reasons that transformers are more efficient compared to models that need to compute everything sequentially. You know, you can in parallel basically compute them. And usually there is a maximum length. Uh, say for example, if your maximum length is 128, means at, at, the, at the time you can pass 128 tokens to the model. And if the dimensionality of your X is D, then it's as if you are passing uh, a matrix of D by 128 to the matrix. And Z would be a matrix of uh, M by Y28 when it will be passed to next layer, which is a uh, fit forward neural network. So conceptually, you can think that there are many neural networks here, each for each of these positions. So position one will go to this neural network, position two goes to this neural network, and so on. But these neural networks are identical. They have the same weight. They're sharing weights. In, in practice, you don't have many. You don't have 128 feet forward neural networks. You just have one. Just, I mean, conceptually, just I want to tell you that this feet forward neural network is identical for all positions. You know, you don't change the weights for each of them. And uh, so this is going to have an output. And we are going to, let's call this out a R, the fit forward neural network. And the fit forward neural network, uh, I will tell you the structure of this fit forward neural network in a moment. Then you are going to have a residual again. So this was Z plus X normalized. And suppose that the output of this is R, you are going to add this to R. So basically this is going to be Z plus X plus R. And then you are going to normalize it. And this will be the output of your uh, encoder. Okay. This is going to be the output of your encoder which will be passed to uh, the decoder. Uh, there is one component here that I haven't talked about yet, position encoding. 
I will talk about this later, but don't forget that there's one component that we didn't talk about, position and code. Okay, so the structure of this feedforward neural network in original transformer is a feedforward with two layers with ReLU as uh, activation function. So whatever the input of this neural network is, is going to be multiplied by some of weights plus some uh, basically bias, and then it will go through a ReLU and then will be multiplied to another set of weights and plus some bias. So it's two layers fit forward neural network with ReLU as activation function in the original paper. Okay. So any idea that why do we need this fit forward neural network? You know, we talked about the role of attention in details in the last lecture that individual words will not be sufficient to comprehend uh, you know a text composition of them are important relation between the words are important and that's what self attention does right okay so i have a mechanism self attention which capture these type of relations and aggregations and compositions okay so why this is not sufficient as encoding the input sentence and then I have to pass it through a layer of feedforward neural network. Because the output of this feedforward neural network would be the output of my encoder. So basically it means that what I have here is not yet a good representation of my, or sufficiently good representation of my sequence then I need to do something else on it after capturing all of these aggregations. Any idea that why do we need this fit forward? Yes? Um, maybe, I'm not sure, maybe we want us to put multiple self-attention steps, steps on top of each other. And so the fit forward introduces the dumb linearity to the value so that we can stack them. Mm -hmm. Yes. But we have a relation between all of the words here. You know, that's what self-attention does. You know, basically self-attention is supposed to find the relation between all of these tokens. You want to add nonlinearity to this. So, uh, so s this soft attention is basically Q transpose K, and uh, so this part is linear, right? But we have a soft max here. Does it make it nonlinear or not? It's still linear. Hmm? It's not enough. It's not linear. Okay. So th there are a couple of good points here, actually. One of them is that adding nonlinearity to to the model um, provides some room for making richer representation of the words or, or tokens. Okay, that, that's one reason. But uh, another actually uh, reason besides, and, and, and this nonlinearity is also, yeah, it, it is, is a good point. Adding also some sort of complexity, I mean adding more layers would also help. You know, we, we have seen that uh, deeper model will generalize better. Okay, so we are adding some more layers to the model. But I believe uh, the main intuition here is making some sort of balance between global information and local information. 
So what self-attention does is to capture global information. You know, aggregation, compositions, you know, what they tell together, what they say all together, groups. But we need a notion of local information as well. We do have a notion of local information as the input of the self-attention. And we, in fact, add it to that to make sure that we haven't forgotten the individuality of each of these tokens. But uh, this neural network, which will be applied to each position separately, is another uh, step to refine these individualities, you know, this local information. If I want to give you an uh, basically analogy, would be, I think that's a good example that I came up with. You know, suppose that we are in a classroom. All the students in the class are different positions. Okay. And then uh, we start, you know, uh, some sort of interaction between the students, you know, group discussion, brainstorm on a subject. The role of teacher now is the role of attention. Teacher look at the class, look at the engagement between the students, and uh, realize some groups in the class, you know, the group has like four groups with four different type of ideas. And these four students, you know, have a good uh, point when you put their argument, you know, together and so on and so forth, you know. Now, after this, we are going to have assessment you know, assessment of students. Now, the role of teacher now is different. What I realize in the, uh, basically, the discussion in the class is not sufficient to evaluate each of these individuals. Now, I have to ask questions individually from each student, but I have all of this information now in mind that uh, I, I gather through you know, interaction of students together. Now I have, I'm going to ask some questions from each student separately and uh, adding this to the information that I gathered from, you know, uh, interaction of students together and groups that they made in my mind. And then that would be uh, the final, uh, basically, uh, uh, assessment of each of these students for me. So we, with this analogy, I think this self-attention play the role of teacher when there, there are some discussions going on in the class and this fit forward play the role of teacher when uh, the, the assessment, individual assessment is in mind. So it's, it's a balance between local and global sort of information, interaction and also uh, individual <coughs> assessment. Uh, <coughs> so that's, as I said, that's basically what the encoder is, you know, and the output of this in is encoder would be x plus z plus r uh, normalized. This will be passed to decoder now, okay? Except that we haven't talked about position embedding yet, and we will talk about it later. Any question? Okay, so that was uh, encoder, and to visualize what encoder does, actually, I uh, gathered some uh, pictures from different papers and, and blogs. This is pretty interesting by uh, J. Lamar. Uh, look at this sentence: the animal didn't cross the street because it was too tired, okay? So we compute the self-attention of this sentence, means the sentence with itself, okay? And there are different layers of 
computing this in layer 5, each of these connections shows correlation or coefficient basically, you know. And uh, the, the T carried the, the, the connection is means the coefficient was larger. So we can see that it attends to the animal, you know. Because when you see, read this sentence, the animal didn't cross the street because it was too tired. There are two possibilities. If you don't know the language, you know, there are two possibilities. It may refer to animal. It may refer to street. You know, who was so tired? Animal was so tired or street was so tired. Uh, so it basically refers to animal, not to street, you know, because the coefficient is large. Uh, this is another interesting example. You have this sentence, the girl and the boy walked home. This is one sentence. And the next sentence starts with she. Okay? So you can see that she attends to the girl. But if the sentence, if the next sentence starts with he, he attends to the boy. Okay. So basically when I, in the next sentence I would say she, I have to know who, who am I talking about, you know. Because in this sentence it was the girl and the boy and when I say she, who? Which one? So she attends to the girl and if the next sentence starts with he, it attends to the boy. Uh, if the next, if the, this sentence is not the sentence itself, but it's a different sentence. And in, in a different sentence, I have uh, names like Alice and Bob. Then when I have she, she attends to Alice, means, I mean, who, who came, she came, Alice came, you know. And, uh, but if I have he, he attends to Bob. You know, it, it recognizes the name in the next sentence, uh, Bob is he, but Alice is she, you know. Okay, so that's the role of this encoder and the attentions of this encoder. Okay, the next part is decoder. And now the information that we uh, distill from our sequence and now will be passed to our decoder. So this is the decoder. Okay. Decoder has three parts. Encoder had two parts, self-attention and feedforward neural network. It has three parts. And instead of self-attention, we have mask self-attention. And then I have another, we have another layer which we haven't seen before in encoder in self-attention. It's, uh, sorry, cross-attention. And then we have a fit forward neural network and fit forward neural network is exactly the same as fit forward neural network that we saw before. Okay, now imagine that in uh, encoder we distill the information, but in decoder I have to generate a sequence, right? When I generate a sequence, I will not attend to words which comes after, because I'm going to predict words, you know. I'm going to make a sentence. I would say that I am a student. I am a teacher, right? When I want to, uh, but after teacher, maybe I say something else, right? I'm a teacher who teaches at the University of Water, right? But when I'm making this sentence, I am a teacher who, I'm here actually, I want to predict this word. So far I predict I am A. So my attention would be only on these words, you know. I haven't predicted the rest yet. Can't attend on those. You know, I, I, I'm generating uh, a, a sequence. I don't have the sequence. So teacher depends on what I have said so far, you know, not on the words that I haven't predicted yet. So that's the, uh, the there are a difference between uh, 
what we know about self-attention in this case. In self-attention, any word attends to any other words, right? Left and right. But now that I want to generate a sequence, I have to attend only to the left, you know? It's a conditional probability. If this is YI, YI would be only given this part, not the rest. So I have to attend only to the previous words, not to the words which comes after. So instead of self-attention, I have masked self-attention. And by masked self-attention means that uh, This is uh, this is self attention, right? And uh, it attends to left and right both, but I need to attend only to left, not to the right. I have to mask whatever tokens is on the right. So there is a very easy way actually to do this. Let me write it this way. So it's one over P Q transpose K. What's the dimensionality of this Q transpose K? Remember? Sorry? N by N. It's N by N. Right? It's n by n. And it's n by n and shows similarity of every word with any other words. Right? <clears throat> so I, I, I told you that it's similar to kernel, except that it's not symmetric. So it's not really a kernel. So similarity of x1 and x1, x2, up to xn, and this is up to xn. So similarity of x1 and x2 is not the same as similarity of uh, x2 and x1. So it's not symmetric, but it shows similarity, right? So it's similarity, it shows similarity of any, any word with any other words. But I want to, sh to have only similarity of a word with words before, right? Not after. So what do you have to do with this matrix? Hmm? means what? <laughs> upper triangle, yeah? So upper triangle I have to set to zero, right? That's it, you know, this will be masked. Oh, yeah, I have masked this part. So in implementation, it's pretty easy. So it's n by n matrix. You are going to multiply, uh, you are going to add this with a matrix M, which is n by n. And entries of this M <coughs> is either zero for this part, or it's going to be negative infinity. For this part, it's negative infinity because you're going to pass it through soft max. So it, it will be basically zero, right? So you you, you are going to, uh, you know, this is this is your uh, attention and you're going to add a matrix M to this, and M is zero if J is less than equal I, and negative infinity if J is greater than I. So it's gonna mask everything that we are going to see afterward, only before, condition under before, okay? So that's the first layer. And then we have, again, this residual, and we have add and norm, similar to self-attention. So the only difference is adding this matrix M. Okay. Uh, then the next layer would be cross attention. And cross attention, we haven't seen this in encoder. But in sequence to sequence model, we have seen cross attention. In sequence to sequence model, remember that we had an RNN as encoder, we had a different RNN as decoder. And decoder in each step to predict a word had to attend to all hidden states of 
encoder and see how similar this is to all hidden states of encoder because I want to predict a word I want to see which this word is similar to which part of the previous sentence right which part of this previous sequence so I have to do cross attention between decoder and encoder and sequence to sequence model and that's something that's going to mimic this cross attention that we had in sequence to sequence model to predicting a word C what happened in the previous sequence uh, so the, the way I mean cross attention work exactly the same as attention with the exception that query comes from the previous layer so that's query but key and value comes from encoder so basically the output of encoder would be my key and values so I have captured all information of the sequence that I encoded in the output of my encoder these are my keys and values I have computed <coughs> the information of my new sequence <coughs> and now I have to see uh, how similar is this as a query with those information that I had in the past right so everything is the same except that uh, here key uh, I mean sorry key comes Q comes from this layer but K and V comes from encoder so all positions that we have encoded in encoder are my K and V but Q comes from the previous layer And then we're going to have add and norm the same as before, you know, have a residual with the same reason. Uh, and the output will be normalized. And then we will pass this to a fit forward neural network exactly the same way that we did it for uh, encoder. And again, this is multi-head, and this is multi-head. It's not that we do it once. We do it H times. We do H times of mask attention. We do H times of uh, um, self-attention. And then we concatenate them. We change the dimensionality through a linear transformation. And then we pass it to feed-forward neural network. One thing that I forgot to tell you is this notation, you know, you see n times. It means that this whole block will be repeated n times. And in the original paper, it's six times. So basically, you know, you have, you had this block of encoder, you repeat it six times. And here you repeat it six times on top of each other. Okay. Uh, and it, you can, you know, appreciate the fact that it's going to find uh, more complicated sort of composition and aggregation. You know, if you attend, if, if in the first layer you attend, if each word attend to another word, then you can compute, you can find uh, the composition of two words together. And now your vector has the information of this composition at the end of this encoding. You have, on the top of this, you have another layer. So you find the composition of composition of compositions, you know. So th these two words, these two words, and now if they are combined together, what's going to happen? And the next layer, next layer, next layer, you know, find the sort of global aggregation of all of these words. So at the end, um, I'm going to have some Z <coughs> plus r plus x normalized similar to encoder but this is encode this is a decoder and i have to predict a word you know for a sequence whatever the dimensionality of this z is the z was m dimensional 
I'm going to pass it through a linear layer, means I'm going to multiply this by a new W. And the role of this new W is to change the dimensionality. Change dimen dimensionality to, to the dimensionality of my vocabulary. You know, suppose that my vocabulary is, f five, I don't know, 10,000. I have 10,000 words in my dictionary. And when I have the sentence, I am a, okay, and I want to predict this. There are 10,000 possibilities because my vocabulary is 10,000. So whatever the dimensionality of this output is, this linear layer, which is just a matri matrix multiplication, is going to map it to this dimensionality, 10,000. This, dim sorry, dimensionality of my vocabulary, 10,000. Okay, and then it will pass through a softmax. And softmax make it a probability vector. So I have a probability vector of length 10,000. I have a probability vector of the length of my vocabulary, which sums to one. And one of these words are more likely than the others, right? Because it's probability vector. And I'm going to choose that word as my next prediction. You know, basically, it's going to be, you know, a distribution <coughs> of words for 10,000 different words. And the chance of this word is higher than the others. And I'm going to choose this word. And maybe this word is teach. Okay. So that's it. This is my decoder. Any question? Yes. Mm -hmm. Why do we need max multi-edition? Multi Why do we need what? Sorry? Like what is the intuition of using the max multi-edition? It, it, it doesn't matter that your job is translation or question answering or whatever. The, the, the model doesn't have any sense of the task. It just have the sense that this is a sequence, this is another sequence that I have to predict, and this new sequence has something to do with this one, right? And uh, has something to do with this one, needs to be calculated in a way, and it will be calculated through cross uh, attention. Other than this, we don't have any information of the past, you know? The output of encoder just comes to this cross attention. We don't have any other input from the encoder to the decoder, right? Yes? Why do we need the encoder? Like, if you just stack this a bunch of times and then replace them, or I guess it will be only on the encoder because there's no cross-attention. So what's your job? What's your task? For which task why do you need the encoder? Because I mean, in a sense, you're right, you know, the GPT, which you are going to talk about, is just decoders. And BERT is just encoders. I mean, depends on your task, you know. You, might have a ta you may have a task in which you just need encoder, or you just need decoder, or you need both of them. But the transformer is encoder-decoder model. So transformer is a model which takes um, source domain, map it to target domain. And to do this, needs to encode the source domain, pass it to decoder, and decoder make representation of the target domain. But you may not need it for some task like text generation, for example, in GPT. You don't need it, which you will see. Okay. <coughs> So, uh, I didn't tell you about this position encoding. Okay. I told you about this linear projection, softmax. I didn't tell you about this position encoding. Okay, so far our model has no sense of uh, orders, right? If I permute 
the words here, nothing will change, right? Instead of I am A, if I say A I am, the same attention will be computed, right? Because I'm just looking at pairs of words, similarity of them. So this has, has no understanding of the order or sequence. And I have to pass this information so, somehow to the model. I have to tell the model that this is the first word, this is the second word, this is the third word. And if, if you scramble them, it's going to be a different sentence, you know. Two sentences with this identical set of words are not identical, you know. They are different sentences if the order of the words are different in these two sentences. So far, we don't have any notion of this, and we need it. We need to pass this information somehow to the model. And that's basically the role of position embedding. And position embedding is a way to encode the position of my tokens in the sequence and pass it to the model. OK, how can I do this? <coughs> you can do it in many different ways. You know, we can do it in many different ways. Actually, one way to do this is to learn it. You know, in these back-to-back -back models, we learn everything. So why don't we learn the position? You know, we assume that a position is represented by a vector. And this vector is going to be concatenated or is going to be added to the representation of each token. And through backpropagation, let's learn it, you know. And this is something that people tried, actually. But in this paper, they realized that they can do something simpler than this. And instead of adding new parameters to the model, in fact, they explained that they, they tried this. And they realized that <coughs> with uh, defining some uh, positions ahead of time, instead of learning them, you don't see much difference in terms of performance, so why don't we add new parameters to the model? Let's, let's just decide, because this is some information that we know about, you know, we know about these orders. That's not really something that we need to learn. <coughs> so, uh, I, I'm um, a teacher. So this is my first word, and I have a, a, a representation for this, and I have a representation for this, and so on. I can add another vector to this with the same size, such that this vector tell me the location. So the location of this is 1. So one zero 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 zero. The location of this is two. Zero one zero zero. So one hot vector. If I add one hot vector, for example, to this, I do have the information of uh, <coughs> the token. But one hot vector is sort of harsh. You know, when you disturb this, you perturb this vector in just one location significantly without touching the rest of that. Um, position embedding that they define is a way to have sort of continuous version of this one hot vector. So it is sort of one hot vector, but it's not like one zero 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 and zero one 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 one. Instead of that, suppose that you have sort of a smooth and continuous variations of these numbers, but it, it, it encodes the location exactly similar to the way that we encode the location with one hot vector. So uh, <coughs> here is the idea. Define a cosine function and a sine function. Here in this definition, this is position, and i is the dimensionality, I mean the location in the uh, position vector. So uh, if I want to 
basically make this vector, for example, if I want this to make this vector, my position here is 1. I'm in the first position. And then I shows the entries. I have two functions, a cosine function and a sine function. And the cosine function, see, it's 2i plus 1, and sine is 2i. So cosine will pick the odd entries. So this will be assigned by cosine, this will be assigned by cosine, this will be assigned by cosine, right? And sine will pick the uh, even numbers, even entries. So this will be uh, picked by sine, sine, sine. So this is basically my cosine function is in, in i equal to zero. And this is the sine function in i equal to zero and this is position. So at position 30, for example, this is, uh, if my position is, say here, is one. At position one, I will look at this value and I look at this value that would be, uh, you know, the values of my uh, entries of this matrix, which I change the i, you know. <coughs> uh, see if I, uh, this is in i equal to zero. i equal to zero means I'm talking about these entries. Sign, assign one of them and cosine assign another one, the first two, right? i equal to zero. If I look at i equal to 50, you know, because of the form of this function. The frequency is less. What does it mean? It means that I'm going to change the first two entries more often than changing the position 50. And I'm going to change position 50 more often than position 100. And uh, this is what's going to happen in uh, one hot vector as well, right? If you are making one hot one hot vector for one thousand positions, you know. First, you have like one zero zero zero, and then immediately, you know, it's going to be zero, one zero zero zero. The first two changed immediately, but the rest didn't change, right? And in third location, you change the third position, but everything else is the same, you know, it's, you change the first three positions. So basically, you can see that in this function, the entries, the, the, the uh, starting entries will change more frequent than, you know, uh, entries with higher i. <coughs> Let me pass this to If you know, uh, if you look at the position and dimension, basically that's going to, let me show you as, this. you know, this, I chose the dimensionality of my vector to be 512. Okay, and the number of position 10. And if I run this code, it will create, with these two functions, it will create the position embedding for position 1, 2, 3, 4, up to 10. And uh, here you are. See, this is position 1 position 2 up to 10. Do you see a similar nature of one hot vector to this encoding, right? Uh, it's not in fact 0 and 1. It's between a negative number, negative 1 and plus 1. But uh, you can see that, you know, uh, it's, it's as if this negative values, you know, the blue one. It's like one in the uh, one hot vector, just shifting down. 
And, you know, when I told you that the frequency for higher position is less, you see that this part where this 10 position is constant. We haven't changed them. But we change this part, you know, immediately. And uh, <coughs> you can see that this basically nature... Or maybe I just show you this movie the, for the first 30. You can see that, you know, it's going to happen. It has a nature pretty similar to one hot encoding. And uh, we simply, you simply add this vector to the representation of your board. <laughs> okay, so now the summation of these two has a notion of location as well. Okay, so that's the way that we encode position <coughs> in um, sorry. Was any question? Yes. Does this not mess with the symmetric content of the word? Because you're adding something to a vector and the vector mean mm -hmm. the embedding of that word. So I guess you're learning something like invariance to this sign thing that we're adding? You know, at the beginning actually, at the beginning of the process you add this to your X and then you pass it to attention. You know? Anything needs to compute it in attention. You know, you're after embedding layer that you just learn a representation of words and at the beginning it's just initial values, you know, some random values. It will be passed to your attention, it will be passed to your F and N and there are several layers of those, you know, and they will be refined over time. It's not that you decided about your representation and at the end you add something to it. At the beginning, you, start, you add something to this, you know. That's your input. But the, like the beginning of all of the vectors, especially the later ones in the position, they're like more perturbed. Like if you look at the first 150 dimensions of mm -hmm. the 10th word, for example, they all have some positional information. Um, and so then you're like forcing the semantic content of the word to be like in the later dimensions. So, in the first word, it seems like you have more space to explore the meaning of that word, whereas the later words only have like Less? 300 dimensions. Yeah. So. No, you're assuming that this is empty and this is not empty. All, all of them are values. Yeah. These are just positive values. This is negative values. So, they are in the same boat, you know, if they have, it's not that at the beginning they have more room to learn and at the end they have less room to learn, you know. These uh, negative value and positive value are the same. Anyway, you are perturbing the vector with some positive values or for, with some negative values, right? But you do it at the beginning of the process, not at the end of the process. <clears throat> if we do it at the end of the process, you are right. You know, we learn some representation, we learn aggregation, we learn composition, and now all of a sudden we add something to this, you know, which may completely ruin what we learned. But we are not doing this. At the beginning, before learning, you know, I have just initial understanding of the meaning of these words in my input embedding in uh, representation of the words at the beginning, you know. And it needs to go through many layers of self-attention, cross-attention, feed forward. Before passing this through all of them, I add the position. And then I will pass it through, right? So you can think of this this way, you know. You have I at the beginning of the sentence and you have I at the middle of the sentence. You just pass two different vectors and it completely makes sense, you know, that I at the beginning and I at the middle may have different role. So you pass two different vectors to the model, you know which is summation of location plus same i, maybe.
Yes. So, like, if you look at the plot, you see that the dimension, later dimensions, hasn't been, like, perturbed. Like, why shouldn't it be really perturbed at the same time? Because you only change the earlier dimensions after, like, No, that, that's exactly the same as one hot vector, you know. In one hot vector, this is one, the rest is zero, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Then you make this zero and this one, and the rest is zero. So the 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 lower part will not change frequently as the upper part will change. Exactly the same as this. You know, the lower part is zero and change later on. Yeah. Exactly the same thing happened here. If instead of 10, I go to 1,000, you will see that this part will change. Oh, okay. it's just the yeah, because the, the, the frequency of sine and cosine with higher, for higher values of i is less. So they will change less often. But they will change eventually. But for a long period of time, it's almost the same values, but it will change, you know. If in a stuff 10, it goes to 10,000, you know, you can see that it's going to be... Uh, <coughs> you know, here actually in this code, if in a stuff 10, I say 10,000. So everything will change eventually. <coughs> okay. Um, yes. So this like never happens, but then this means you're restricted. Your I can't be bigger than D, right? Yes. Because it should be actually exactly the same dimensionality of x, you know, because you want to add these two. If your x is d-dimensional, this, this should be d-dimensional, not less, not more. I cannot be more than d. No. <coughs> because you need to make a vector with the same dimensionality. Um, Actually, the, the, the net rest of this lecture is going to be about GPT, BERT, and uh, I don't think we have enough time to finish this. Maybe I just introduce these two and then complete it in the next lecture. Uh, GPT was introduced in 2018 uh, in this paper with this set of authors in OpenAI. And same year, BERT was introduced in Google, in this paper. <coughs> um, and Transformer, I mean, attention all you need was 2017. So 2017, we had Transformer. And 2018, we had BERT and we had GPT. Uh, so roughly, you can think of BERT as a stack of encoders. You know, in the transformer, take the encoder part and make a stack of them, many of them, roughly. This is BERT. And you can think of GPT as a stack of decoder. So take the decoder part with some additional details that I'm going to tell you take the decoder part and stack them together, and that's going to be GPT. And with BERT, you can find the representation of a sentence. You can find word representation. And with GPT, you can generate a text. OK? <coughs> OK, let's stop here. And then we will talk about BERT and GPT in more details in the next lecture. Any question? Okay.